Hello again, and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 17, and it is entitled Uniformly Accelerated Motion. With this lesson, we begin grappling with how to mathematically describe objects moving with more than simple constant velocity. Whenever an object changes the way that it moves, whether it changes its direction or its speed, we say that the object experiences acceleration. Before we get too far into this lesson, let me mention a couple of caveats. The first one is this. Many times, may I say most of the time, the most common types of motions involve complicated accelerations. So if you think, for instance, of a leaf fluttering down from a tree or an insect flying through the air, these objects move all over the place and describing their motion mathematically would be quite challenging. So to get a handle on describing objects, we might make some simplifying assumptions, building a model that captures the features of the motion that we want to examine, but omitting distracting details that we don't care about. This model building business is something we'll be doing quite a bit of during this course, and so you need to get used to it. So the caveat is this, our mathematical descriptions will be a step forward in describing the motion, but they will likely leave out all kinds of details. Now here's the second caveat. In this lesson, we will restrict our focus onto a very special kind of acceleration, and that is called uniform acceleration or constant acceleration. To say that an object experiences uniform acceleration is to say that, numerically speaking, the object is well behaved. It changes its velocity in the same way during the entire time interval in which we're interested in it. It turns out that this is a very restrictive type of motion, and most objects don't really behave in this way. But examining uniformly accelerated motion is a start, and in many cases it'll provide us with a good approximation for our purposes. For many types of motion over short time intervals, this type of modeling will suffice. It turns out that in order to handle more complicated motions involves the mathematical discipline of calculus, and we'll not take it up explicitly because this course is not a calculus-based course. So, to repeat, we'll only handle motion under constant acceleration, which is to say that the acceleration is a number that will not change over the time interval of interest. In this lesson, we'll begin handling one-dimensional motion, whether it's horizontal or vertical. And in later lessons, we'll take up something called projectile motion, which combines into a single object, like a baseball that's thrown up in the air, both horizontal and vertical motions. We call that special case projectile motion, and you are guaranteed to see that kind of motion on college board exams in the spring. Now, what do we mean by describing motion? Here's what we mean. It means that we're interested in four general quantities. These are the quantities of time, position, velocity, and acceleration. Let's begin with time. Time, which means when something happens, is represented by the variable t. Technically speaking, what we mean by the variable t is the elapsed time. Elapsed time meaning the time between when we started our clock and the moment that we're interested in it. The next variable is position, which means where something is. We're interested in velocity, which means how fast and which way is something moving. And finally, we're interested in acceleration, which means how fast the velocity is changing and in which direction. So let's introduce ourselves to this cast of characters who will strut and fret upon the stage, telling their tale about what's happening with the object. As we said before, we'll represent the elapsed time using the variable t. We make the assumption that at some moment we're suddenly interested in how the object's moving, and we'll start our clock at that moment. That's t equals zero. We'll have to account for what the object's doing at that moment, and we'll illustrate that just briefly. The next variable is position. And we'll have two types of position, namely the initial position, where the object is when we begin the clock, and the instantaneous position, where the object is at elapsed time t. We'll represent those with variables x and x naught. You'll see that we call this zero in the subscript of these variables by the name of naught. So the initial position is referred to as x naught. It's the location of the object in some frame of reference at the moment we start our clock. 
your text throws in the variable delta d for displacement, but I won't use that variable much in problem solving. I prefer to keep to the variables x and x naught. Just realize that in your text, delta d equals x minus x naught. You'll notice that I'm writing x and x naught down with these vector signs, and that delta d is also a vector, x minus x naught. And you'll see that sometimes we keep these vector signs, and sometimes we drop them. But just because they don't appear doesn't mean that you shouldn't remember that they are vectors, which means that they have a magnitude and they have a direction. Both the sign and the numerical value of the quantity has a physical meaning. We could just as well talk about vertical variables, in which case we'll use y's instead of x's. When you think of position, you should think about where you are on a calibrated number line or a calibrated Cartesian coordinate plane. So think about, in your math course, plotting points on a number line or placing data points in certain locations on a grid based on ordered pairs of coordinates. The coordinates may have positive values or negative values, and those signs have physical meanings in the context of whatever reference frame we're working in. While we don't have to, oftentimes we'll set the origin of our number line or our grid at the place where the object is located at the moment that we start our clock. So to make this concrete, let's consider a horizontal reference frame. At time t equals zero, let's say an object is located at a certain position. Say x naught is equal to minus 3.5 meters. The object then moves. Maybe it accelerates, maybe it doesn't. But whatever it does, at some later time t, it's found someplace else. Let's say that it's found at x is equal to plus 2.0 meters. Wherever the object is located when we begin to clock, we mark that as x naught. That's at the negative 3.5 meter point. And wherever it is when the lapse time t has emerged, we mark it as position x. That's the 2.0 mark. The displacement of this object, delta d, is given by the difference between these two points, x minus x naught, which in this case is equal to plus 2 minus a negative 3.5. In this case, it's equal to plus 5.5 meters. In plain English, the number tells us how far the ending position is from the starting position during this time interval t. In this case, it's 5.5 meters and the sign tells us in which direction that that point lies. In this case, it's in the positive direction. The object is located a position 5.5 meters to the right of where it began. The displacement is a vector quantity requiring both a magnitude, which is the number, and a direction, which is the sign, to completely describe it. Now let's go back to our cast of characters. Knowing the object's location is important in describing the motion, but we also need some further information when we are going to try to predict what it's going to do in the future. The object moves, and we need to know how fast and which way it's moving. And we do this by classifying the variable v for velocity. While the velocity is a vector quantity, it's not as easy to visualize as the position is. Nevertheless, we'll represent it with an arrow whose length, on an appropriate scale, tells us how fast it's going. The direction the arrow points tells us which way the object is moving when it reaches that point in space. We'll call the initial velocity v naught and the instantaneous velocity v. On our number line, we can show these arrows like so. Let's suppose that at time t equals zero that our object was moving to the right with a speed of, say, plus three meters per second. And let's suppose that at some later time t that the velocity is negative one meters per second. That negative sign tells us which way to point our arrow when we sketch the diagram. Back to our cast of characters. The last bit of information that we're going to need for describing the object's motion is its acceleration, and we'll symbolize that using the letter A. Whenever the object's velocity changes, we say that the object accelerates. You'll recall that we defined the average acceleration in Lesson 7. The average acceleration is equal to the change in the velocity divided by the time interval. Numerically speaking, if we know the initial velocity, 
and we know the final velocity, or the velocity at the instant in time we're interested, we can find the change in velocity. It's v minus v naught. And we can compute a numerical value for the average acceleration if we know something about the time interval, delta t, during which the velocity change takes place. In this particular lesson, the numerical value of the acceleration won't change during the time interval we're interested in. This is what we mean by the term uniform acceleration. It means that the acceleration is constant. We'll come to see the, that one very special case of uniform acceleration is something called free fall motion, which is what happens to an object when gravity is the only force acting on it. And we'll handle that special case of uniform acceleration very soon in a future lesson. So now let's write down the three equations of motion under a constant acceleration. The first equation is this. V is equal to V naught plus A T. Here's what it says. You want to know how fast the object's going at time T? You got to know how fast it was going when you started your clock, and you need to know how that speed was changing and the time interval over which the change took place. The second equation says this. If you want to know something about where the object's going to be at a certain time t, then you need to know where it was to start with, how fast it was moving, and how fast that speed was changing. x is equal to x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. Finally, there's an equation relating velocity of the motion not explicitly showing the time variable. It looks like this. v squared equals v naught squared plus 2a times x minus x naught. Naturally, if we're talking about vertical equations, then we would replace the x's with y's, but you get the idea. All three of these equations come from calculus, and we're not going to derive them, though if you're interested in seeing them, come by sometime and I'll be happy to show you where they come from. They involve integrating appropriate definitions or equations, and in one case, using something that's called the chain rule. Now, your authors provide you with four equations in a table in this lesson that you see that I've given you only three equations. I think you find their fourth equation is not going to be as useful to you, and so I'm going to stick to these three. These three equations of motion under constant acceleration will be workhorses in your study of one-dimensional and two-dimensional motion. They're going to come up over and over and over again, and you need to memorize them. I encourage you to use these equations and every other equation you encounter in this course, and buddy, there's going to be a bunch of them, that you'll use these equations as guides for thinking. And bring your own personal experience into play, too. Reflect on how you've seen objects behave, and then use the equations to help you understand where that behavior comes from and what influences the object to do what it does. Now, I'll remind you of one of the caveats I gave you earlier. It's this. These equations of motion are only valid for situations in which the acceleration is constant or is uniform. There are many interesting situations, and some that we'll encounter in this course in which the acceleration is not constant, and in those cases you cannot apply these three equations. For example, when we deal with periodic motion involving a mass on a spring, or involving a simple pendulum, or when we deal with objects moving in circles, such as planets around the sun, or figures on a carousel, these objects repeat their motions in regular ways. We'll be really interested in describing these systems, but their accelerations are not constant. But you're definitely going to have to wrestle with constant acceleration, and so these three equations are going to be important to you for a while. Let's begin with some specific examples.